Um, before we get your final thoughts, I just want to extend this to one other area, and that is to just ask both of you how you are integrating next, ge next generation sequencing, if at all, into your practices and what you would, sh what you would hope our, our colleagues would do. When do you biopsy, send it off, and then choose therapies? Um, uh, Dr. Paul, what, how are you doing that? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, you know, Dr. Figlin, you're at a center where you have a multitude of phase one clinical trials uh, that are directed towards certain genetic aberrations. I find that doing genomic profiling early on may potentially benefit the patient at a later stage in their treatment by identifying potential uh, studies of interest. Beyond that, you know, what I've seen in uh, patients that I've profiled myself is several mutations uncovered that might predispose to response to either VEGF-directed therapy or mTOR-directed therapy. In a handful of patients, I've seen mutations in several genes, TSC1, mTOR, et cetera, and uh, I've correlated those with responses to TOR inhibition. Uh, these are all anecdotal reports. I've published several of these at this point in time. What I'm perhaps most excited about is data that I'm presenting tomorrow pertaining to a cohort of 443 patients assessed using the Foundation Medicine platform. This is a comprehensive genomic profiling assessing uh, DNA per, uh, pertaining to more than 200 genes. Um, and what we found is essentially a, a multitude of various genetic aberrations. You earlier cited a case of BRAF mutation you saw in your clinic. We're seeing mutations in ATR and uh, MET and, and other uh, 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 clinically actionable uh, genomic regions. And I think that this could potentially have big implications for individual patients. And Dr. George, how are you integrating this in your practice? So uh, I totally agree with the investigational approach of uh, sequencing uh, studies, um, uh, purely to be investigational at this point. But in the meantime, uh, another perplexity is that uh, the Gerlinger paper, which was a, a big eye-opening paper published a couple of years ago, uh, which basically talks about the heterogeneity in different parts of the same tumor. And, and for the same reason, you know, multiple metastases, they could be behaving differently based on the signature. So um, s if we perform sequencing studies, we might find multiple mutations. And, and which one to optimally target. So that's, that's going to be a challenge with kidney cancer. I think it's, it's a disease which is constantly undergoing mutations and, and, and becoming complex and complex as, as we go through multiple lines of treatments or as it evolves over time. So I'm very, very optimistic that we will find something, but in the meantime, this is a big challenge that I see. So uh, we've, we've discussed a lot and reviewed an enormous amount of, of information on the treatment of metastatic uh, kidney cancer. Let me give you a few seconds of my own uh, summary and then ask you both for your comments before we bring this to a close. I mean, I think, I think kidney cancer is at a crossroads. Uh, those of us that have been in this disease uh, for a long time have, have now seen um, the ear of targeted therapy having a tremendous benefit for patients. And that, that, uh, that era, uh, a lot of people deserve uh, uh, success in it, and that's industry, relationships with academia, patients, and their communities. Um, we now have the first hint from the Assure study that, that despite our hopes that when you treat advanced disease patients, you can translate that into success in early stage patients, as with what's happened with cytotoxic therapy, that may not be borne out in kidney cancer. And we have our first hint that, that maybe anti-angiogenic therapy is not the answer. It, uh, we still have the EVERS trial, which is looking at mTOR inhibition in that study population, and a variety of other anti-angiogenic trials that are looking at similar space and uh, a little bit different in their design. We have the evolving area of checkpoint inhibition, which I think is going to consume us for the next block of time. Uh, we have uh, drugs like uh, the Amatix trial and the Argos trial in the frontline setting using off-the-shelf vaccines or personalized immune therapy. We have cabozantinib looking at the role of CMET in the second-line setting when compared with Everolimus. So it remains a very dynamic time in kidney cancer. I think we're getting a much better handle on how to pick the populations that are most likely to not do well. 
Um, integration of next generation sequencing, I think, uh, remains a field to be, to be tested. So, uh, you know, Dr. George, um, what excites you? Um, how do you see this field evolving? And, and uh, uh, what are some of your last thoughts? So the excitement about uh, treating kidney cancer is, is stemming from the fact that this is a very challenging disease to treat. So that gives me more rigor to, to continue the work in this field. And, uh, and again, the challenges, as we pointed out, um, uh, Dr. Powell and Dr. Figlin um, talked about the challenges, including you know, the heterogeneity and, and uh, the lack of a biomarker and not having a, a one particular target to go for in terms of therapy. Those are, those are the challenges. We have a lot more science to be generated in this field, and uh, we need to learn the cancer cell at, at, in depth. And, and I think uh, uh, we, we are humbled by the fact that there's no cure for this disease, even in this day and age. So we, we definitely need to continue the uh, studies, both in the lab and the clinics. Dr. Paul? Yeah, with, with the multitude of targeted therapies that we have available, it may seem less compelling to get patients early on to centers of excellence for clinical trials. I would still implore my colleagues in the community to consider sending patients to us for first line and second line trials. These are their opportunities in many cases to get PD-1 inhibitors, to get cabozantinib, et cetera. So I think that's really critical. I think that comment's been made before. One thing that I'd like to add to the discussion is that if you haven't done genomic profiling in your patients, just give it some thought. Many patients that you see in practice may not necessarily be trial candidates down the line. And I think that genetic profiling may offer some hints as towards various therapeutic approaches that can be attempted in that setting. On behalf of our panel, we thank you for joining us, and we hope you found this peer exchange discussion to be useful and informative.